Before we leave two-dimensional materials, it would be a pity not to talk about what might be the most famous two-dimensional material, graphene. So one of the things that we're going to encounter to describe the band structure of graphene is that now our unit cell axes are no longer orthogonal, right? We have a hexagonal lattice. So let's start by figuring out how we're going to define the reciprocal space lattice for a hexagonal system. So I show here on the left our real space lattice. Remember that the vectors a and b are equal in length to each other and the angle between them is 120 degrees. Now, let's remind ourselves of the criteria for determining the reciprocal space lattice vectors. So the A star vector must be perpendicular to B. Let's start with that. All right, so we see that A star is going to go vertically down in our drawing here. And the B star vector is going to be perpendicular to A. So the B star vector is off at that angle. And we see that the reciprocal space lattice vectors make an angle of 60 degrees with respect to one another. And if we were to draw the entire lattice of reciprocal space points, it would look like this. Right? It still has that hexagonal symmetry to it, but the lattice vectors are now pointing in somewhat different directions. Let's define our first Brillouin zone. So remember that the first Brillouin zone is the locus of points that are closest to the lattice point at the origin than to any other point. So to find that, what we're going to do is to draw lines from the origin point to all of the nearest points, and then we're going to bisect each of those lines. And when we do, we get a hexagon. All right, so the first Brillouin zone for a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice is a hexagon. Already, this is different than what we had when we were talking about the crystallography of real space lattices. Right? Because remember, the first Brillouin zone is a wigner seitz cell, and so it's defined in a somewhat different way than a crystallographic unit cell. Let's look at the magnitude first of the real space lattice vectors. So here we're going to use Cartesian coordinates. When we look at B, we see it's a long Y, and the magnitude of it is just the length of the lattice vector. A represents the length of the lattice vector. Then the A lattice vector also has to have the same length, but notice that it is not pointing just in the X direction. The vectors are not orthogonal, but instead we have basically a 30-60 right triangle here. So the Length in the x direction is square root of 3 over 2 times a, and the length in the y direction is minus 1 half times a. Now, when we take the dot product of a times a star, that's got to be 2 pi, and b times b star has to be 2 pi. And so that gives us these lattice vectors. So these are the Cartesian coordinates of them. I'll leave it for you to confirm that if you take a dot a star, you get 2 pi, and if you take b dot b star, you get 2 pi. Okay, now let's talk about the special symmetry points in the first Brillouin zone of a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice. At the center of the first Brillouin zone, we have the gamma point, where the reciprocal space lattice vectors are zero, or the, the k vectors we can say are zero. Then we have uh, this, this point here, M, which exists uh, at the center of one of the hexagonal edges of the first Brillouin zone. Right? And so that's going to be 1 half times the A star vector and no component of B. And then we have these two special points, K and K prime, right? that exist at the corners of the hexagon. And to get to K, we're going to go 1 third times A star plus one-third times B star. To get to K prime, we're going to go two-thirds of A star and then minus one-third of B star. All right, so these are key points that we're going to look at their energies and their crystal orbitals when we analyze the band structure of graphene. 
Below, I write the Cartesian coordinates, but for the most part, we're not going to pay too much attention to those. So everything I've set up to this point is generic for any crystal that has a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice. But what do we say specifically about graphene? Right, so here's the structure of graphene. We see that graphene is this two-dimensional honeycomb, or you might think about it as chicken wire, right, of these fused benzene rings. Uh, the unit cell here contains two carbon atoms, uh, and they're on the Wyckoff site 2b of the plane group P6MM. So what about the electronic structure? Well, the atomic orbitals on carbon that we're worried about would be the 2s orbital, the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. Right? There are two carbon atoms in the unit cell. So the entire band structure would have eight bands. Here I'm showing the five lowest energy bands. So the three bands that are the lowest at M or at K, those are all sigma bands. It turns out that at the gamma point, the 2s orbital is orthogonal to the 2p orbitals. So this crystal orbital down here is only 2s in character uh, and it's bonding. And at this point, we have two bands that are degenerate. That would be the 2px and the 2py band. This is a feature we'll see time and time again. When we go to the gamma point, we'll find a crystal orbital made only from valence shell s orbitals that's bonding, and then orthogonal crystal orbitals made from the valence shell p orbitals that are antibonding. Now, as it turns out, these sigma bands are not really the ones that we're interested in here. Just like in benzene, where the key features of the electronic structure come from the pi overlap, the same thing is true of graphene. So these two that are labeled pi and pi star, those come from the overlap of the 2pz orbital. That is the p orbital that is perpendicular to the plane of the graphite sheet. Okay, and that orbital everywhere in the first Brewan zone is orthogonal to the other three. So if we want to think about what's happening with these bands, we only have to consider the pi overlap between the two pz orbitals. Right? And so that's going to simplify the analysis. Now, up at higher energy, we are going to find the antibondy sigma bands. Those are not shown here. They're not particularly important for the properties. But let's take a closer look now at the pi and pi star bands and see if we can visualize the crystal orbitals at key points in the Brillouin zone. So let's start with gamma. Gamma is always the easiest. The fact that we have two bands comes from the fact that we have two pz orbitals in the unit cell, one for each carbon atom. And so the basis set for each band is going to be the pi bonding molecular orbital for the lower band and then the pi antibonding molecular orbital for the upper band. Here we're looking down on the lobe of the p orbital that's coming up out of the plane at us. You can see that at gamma, the interaction between each carbon and its three nearest neighbors is bonding. So we have pi bonding interactions everywhere. And so this is going to be a bonding orbital. It's going to be low in energy. That orbital is right here, and you can see that it's the lowest energy crystal orbital. On the other hand, the pi antibonding orbital, you can see that each carbon forms antibonding pi interactions with its three nearest neighbors. So this is the most antibonding crystal orbital in the entire first Brie 1 zone. So it comes at a considerably higher energy. Let's now go to M. All right, so remembering our reciprocal space lattice vector at M, it was one half times the A star direction plus zero times the B star direction. So that means in the real space unit cell, when we move in the A direction, right, we're going to change the phase of our orbital every time we move in the A direction. But when we move in the B direction, we're not going to change the phase of that orbital. So if we start with our bonding molecular orbital, let's just arbitrarily call A in this direction now. If we move one unit cell one direction, we change the phase. And every time we move a unit cell in that direction, we change the phase of the orbitals. When we move in the other direction, the phase of the orbitals doesn't change. So we end up with something where 
each carbon is forming two pi bonding interactions with its neighbors and one pi antibonding interaction. And so the net result is a weakly bonding crystal orbital. For the antibonding band, um, we're going to change the phase in the same way. Notice when I'm moving horizontally here, I change the phase of the orbital each time I go from one unit cell to the next. Whereas when I go along the other lattice vector, I'm keeping the same phase everywhere. This crystal orbital, you can see, has two antibonding interactions and one bonding interaction per carbon. So this is a weakly pi antibonding interaction. And if we look at the bands at M, we can see that there's still a fair energy separation between the two of them. All right, what about if we go to K? When we go to the K point, then we have one-third lattice vector in both directions. Okay, so what that means is that as we move through the crystal lattice, we're going to change the phase of our orbital once every three unit cells. And so th this orbital is a lot harder to visualize, but the point being, if I start here and I move one, two, three unit cells, then I've got the same phase back again. If I start here and I move one, two, three unit cells, I've got the same phase back again. If you look at this, and here I'm only plotting the real part of the wave function. Right, there's actually an imaginary part of the wave function at this k point. If you look at it, what you should first of all see is that if we start on this carbon atom, the three carbon neighbors, the coefficient of the pz orbital on those atoms is zero. Right? And so this is a non-bonding orbital. And, and further, if you look at these two, you would pretty quickly conclude that the non-bonding nature is true for both the pi and the pi star band. So at k these two bands touch precisely, okay? And if we think about the electron filling here, right, in a carbon atom, four valence electrons, so in a unit cell, we're going to have eight valence electrons, so that's enough to fill up four bands. So we can fill all three of these sigma bands and this pi band, and we leave the pi star band empty. Now, a couple lectures ago, I said, you know, you could visualize the band structure of a two-dimensional crystal with a three-dimensional plot. And here is one such plot for graphene, specifically for the pi and the pi star bands in graphene. So we can see in this plane, here is our first Brillouin zone. Now right at the middle of the first Brillouin zone, right, that's going to be where kx and ky are both zero. That's the gamma point. And you see that way down here, is the energy of the crystal orbital that comes from the pi band. And up here, we see the energy of the pi star band at gamma. Right? And there's a large separation between the two of them. If we go to K, notice that the bands now touch each other. Right? We just said that they become degenerate at K. And at K prime, which we didn't show, we see the same thing. So as we move around the periphery of our hexagonal first Brillouin zone, we find six points where the upper band and the lower band just touch. And in the language of the electronic structure of graphene, those are called Dirac points. And so the fact that they just touch, first of all, that makes graphene a perfect semi-metal. Right? So we talked about metals and semiconductors. In a metal, the band cuts through a Fermi level. In a semiconductor, there's a gap between the filled and empty bands. In a semi-metal, a perfect semi-metal, the bands just touch. So the Fermi level is not cutting through a band, but on the other hand, there's no gap. And what that means is if by chemical means or by an electric field, we dope graphene, we can dope it p-type by taking a few electrons away. That's going to lower the Fermi level, and now the Fermi level will cut through these these bands below the, this shaded plane. If we were to reduce it, uh, we are going to add electrons to the conduction band, and then the Fermi level will move up. So any change from the perfect electron count is going to convert graphene from a semi-metal to a metallic conductor. 
The other unique thing about the electronic structure of graphene is that if we were to move away from the Dirac points, we would see that the energy of the pi star band increases linearly in the wave vector k as we move away from either the k or the k prime points. By the same token, the energy of the pi band decreases linearly with respect to the wave vector k. This is something very special, and when we get to chapter 10, we're going to look at the implications of that in a little bit more detail.